You are now listening to Abstract Thought. This is a podcast where Midwest creatives and creatives from all around the world discuss uh, the business of art, some of their passions, and their creative journey in general. Today, I'm sitting down with the one and only indie legend, Dan Thompson, kind of known by Invisible Hometown, Fab Crew. You've probably seen a lot of his art and, and murals around the city. He's He's been crushing it for decades here in Indy and definitely has been you know, coming up in the scene as an artist here myself, it's been crazy to see all the things Dan and his buddy Ben have produced. And uh, yeah, man, welcome to the podcast. Excited to chat. What's up, man? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, it's always it's always wild to hear people uh, to hear your journey described in the words of other people. So I dig it. Definitely, man. If you don't know who Dan is, if you're completely in the dark with Indianapolis somehow and have never seen Dan stuff, which I think is hard to believe. What are your social channels and where can people find and, you know, continually engage with your stuff past just the podcast? The place, the, the, the best place to find me is on generally my Instagram feed, Invisible Hometown. It's actually Invisible underscore home, Hometown, but if you search for Invisible Hometown, you'll find it. Um, my website is called InvisibleHometown.com. Um, and that's really, that's where I'm running most of my stuff through these days. That's, those are my channels. Sweet. Perfect. Yeah, definitely go check Dan's stuff out. Um, he's, he, he's a killer. Um, the first thing I'd like to chat about is kind of like early childhood. You know, when you, a lot of artists say, oh, I've been an artist my whole life. Um, but some of that, you know, comes back to a certain experience or maybe yeah. a moment when you're a kid that kind of sparked some of that. Did you have artists in the family or people in the neighborhood you knew, or how'd you kind of get into art in general? Um, it's funny. I don't think about this very much, but, um, I can't, I can't think of anyone I knew that was an artist at, except for my cousin, his, his, everybody called him boo. Um, and he was like maybe four, I don't know. He was a few years older than me. Um, <clears throat> he was our oldest of our cousins. He was like the firstborn, and I wasn't really close to the rest of them, but he would draw and like, listen to heavy metal and stuff like that. So, uh, eventually, I don't know if he was the first person I knew that showed me art, but he's definitely the first person I went into their house and saw drawings. Um, other than that, I mean, dude, I, I cannot think of like, I can't think of anyone that I, even that, like, even when I think of those memories, that really is probably like 10 or 11. So for some reason I was drawing all the time by myself, you know? So I didn't, I was raised by my grandmother. I didn't have, um, I had siblings, but no one lived with me. It was just, excuse me, it was just the two of us. So I just would spend countless hours drawing and I don't know why I started doing it, but those people I met along the way were more like reasons that I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think I, w I do feel like I wasn't really encouraged to be an artist, but when you're a kid, nobody's, nobody discourages you from being creative. Not until you become a teenager and they're like, you're never going to get a job. You know what I mean? Right. That's awesome, man. What, yeah. what kind of stuff was your cousin drawing? Do you remember like band logos oh, yeah. or something? I mean, yeah, probably. But dude, skulls, it, skulls were like his absolute jam. Like, um, and I remember his dad, who's not an artist. He told me once his dad taught him how to draw a skull. It's just a keyhole. And then like two little things sticking out the side, like the Punisher logo is just a keyhole. So, uh, it's like i can't even tell you it was all creep like you know like old metallica covers like the old ones if you've ever seen them they had this movie called a year and a half in the life of metallica or even like uh the dude eddie the character from like the iron maiden album covers and stuff that kind of stuff just like specifically things with claws and skull heads you know bat wings like straight up just hood rat shit yeah that's awesome yeah that's so cool man were you getting into music around like a similar time too? Is did he introduce you to some music or where did you uh, kind of start delving into that stuff? I, I imagine he's probably the first person I ever saw play music. Um, and definitely again, when I was like 17, 18, he was somebody that I would get together and actually play music with on a very regular basis. But uh, my first musical memory is really my grandma bought an organ. 
or maybe somebody gave it to her. You know, it's like she was like a she was like a trash or second hand, third hand, like like queen pin. You know what I mean? <laughs> People would come to her like before, like let's go, let's go ask Helen before we let it go to somebody else. And she got this organ, and it was you know like a full piano's eighty eight keys. This organ had like maybe 30 it was very small and i think it might have been kid sized in the end but you plug it in you turn it on and you know the thing about an organ is air air is what makes that sound of an organ um whether it be pipes i think it's always pipes but this one it had this you turn it on you could hear the fan turn and then i remember playing this melody on three keys it was like these three fingers these three keys that's my whole that's my whole repertoire for hours um that was my first musical memory and I, until the reason that i that it ever became structured in a part of my life is because when i was in the fifth grade um the junior high band leader came to the school and they just had a room full of instruments and they're like anybody who's interested it was the most random thing anybody who thinks they might want to play in band uh on this day they're going to bring some instruments so sign up and you can go in there and so I went in and they just have like a few things around you. Like, here's a horn, here's a violin, here's a couple drumsticks. Like, what do you think you would want to do? Uh, and look, and in hindsight, that's, that to me is crazy. Like asking a bunch of people in fifth grade, like, what do you think out of this room full of it? And to, it, maybe it was only like two instruments, but to me, it was like, they showed me the entire world of music what is what was in there. And I started, I was like, I, I just grabbed the drumsticks and I was like, I think I want to do this. Uh, he's like, why? And I was like, I don't know. The drums are cool. And he goes, what do you think I play? And I looked at him like this. I said, clarinet. And he goes, I'm a drummer. And I was like, oh, okay. So it, there was a drummer in the room who was the band, the leader of the band at that time at the junior high was a drummer. I don't know. I can't even tell you why I, I, I wanted to do it, but it's the only instrument. It, it came naturally to me. You know, sort of like drawing, it just I started doing it and not a master, but definitely understood it. You know, that's awesome, man. Would, would you say you discovered both of like these interests around a similar time or was mm. music a little later after you're just because as a kid, you, I don't know, you messing around with a piece of paper, you doodle here and there. But, you know, you do doodle on the paper. <laughs> you do doodle uh, I feel like music is like something that when you're halfway through elementary school or something you're like oh i can i have enough brain function to remember songs now you yeah. know that type of a thing well um i don't really remember the first time i did drawing i mean that that to me is something that just had to have happened it, it must have been this way forever mm -hmm. um but i do remember the first time i played music and I mean, I, I think I was like 11 or 12 in fifth grade. So that's when I, the guy first came in and brought the stuff. So my beginning of music to me is when I was 12. But by the time I was 12, I was like, had my own terrible superhero teams that I had made up, you know, that were based. Everything was a knock. It was all X-Men. X-Men was like the, the biggest band in the world of comics. And so everybody, it was like the Wu-Tang Clan of comics, basically. So everybody wanted to have this X-Men. So I had my own X-Men team, but that was, I, I mean, I've, I got yelled at for drawing in school since day one. I, I mean, I, I don't remember ever being in school and not drawing when I should have been doing something else, you know? Yeah. That's awesome, man. I can definitely relate. Every time there's like blank negative space on the side of, you know, some homework assignment, I'm just constantly looking at that, trying to fill oh, yeah. it at all times. You know? I still have pages of notes I run across every now and then that I'm like, I save, I saved them just because I thought that the, the drawing I did that was this wide was super cool. Like, I, I don't know. I still have some of that stuff. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll let it go eventually, but. That's cool. You've it, saved them. It's cool to run across them, you know, and see things that were in your, were, were there from years ago, way earlier than you think they would be like the things that, that I associate with my stuff now some of that stuff I'll look back on these like notebook pages and they've, they've been there for since the beginning, you know, what type of stuff like from that point and also maybe middle school, high school-ish, what were you drawing around that time? Like subject matter wise, or. I mean, it was all about through middle school. It was definitely all about, uh, 
comics. I mean, as much as possible. Jim Lee was my favorite artist. Um, and when I was, uh, I guess, a sophomore in high school, I moved across town to a different school, another big school, a bigger school, actually. And um, I would eventually discover graffiti. But that first year when I was a sophomore, I, my guidance counselor was like, well, you need to take some stuff. You need some like electives. I see you were in the band at your old school. Uh, you know, what do you think? And I was like, no, like my old school had like a state championship football team and had a very competitive marching band. This new school had a state championship football team and a very competitive marching band. And uh, I didn't think I was up to it and I didn't find it very fun. There was so much pressure, um, you know, people in the marching band very much, their schedule mirrors the, the football schedule. And when football season is over, there's an entire winter schedule of, of just stuff you do if you're drumline or if you're, you play a horn or whatever. So <clears throat> it was grueling. And uh, there was only one month of the year that, that you have like 30 days when nothing happens. And I, that was, I think it was July. And so like every kid in the band program, all the, the teachers and their, their spouses, like if you, you couldn't go to Florida or like spend a week in the mountains, like you, and to me, that was, I needed to get a job, dude. I, I didn't, I just didn't see it. So when I came to the other school, I was like, I don't want to go back into this other competitive environment. Um, and I didn't actually want to take any art classes either because I didn't like in the seventh grade, I took a class that was supposed to be for gifted and talented artists. And, we spent weeks drawing like a plant, you know, and again, in hindsight, I, I understand that. But as a kid, I was like, this is stupid. I never want to do this again. And so I took journalism because they're like, that'll help you with your writing. I think they just told kids that I think they just told journalism. Kids, like, here's a good reason to take this. They're like, your, your writing will get better. Your grades will get better. And your college applications will be better. And I was like, I didn't have any plan beyond like beyond beyond sitting in that chair at that time. I didn't have any yeah. thought. And so I took journalism and then I took an art class just because again, I needed two electives and um, the art class was kind of the, that was the beginning of me actually having structure and learning about art up until that point, dude, it was really all. So until sophomore year of high school, everything I had in terms of uh, my artistic style was like straight out of books, whether it be comics or, you know, um, I would remember like getting a sci-fi book from the library and maybe not even reading it, just looking at that cover with the dome city and all the ridiculous, like smoking clouds, which you still see in my, it's in a drawing I'm working on right now. These like swoopy cloud formations. Uh, I mean, I could look at one image dude for three years, like, I've, I still have my first scribble magazine and for probably a solid seven years, I took it with me everywhere I went. Got to sit at the BMV, got a three hour road trip, going to go get on a plane, going to spend a week on the beach. I took that, that one, one graffiti magazine with me everywhere for like years. And I can't believe how much inspiration I got out of that small number of images. I look at stuff now and it's so overwhelming probably by the time I got into high school, I was very much into, I don't do sketches anymore. I just do like just ink drawings. And it was like psychedelic. You could tell that uh, you could tell that I had begun to expand my mind because suddenly things were melting and there was whole images just made only of flowers and, you know, drawings that I would start on and just like pick them up every, every week or every two weeks or, you know, doing wide out drawings on my, on my trapper keeper. I mean, it was like, there was, I can't even, I can't remember the first time I had a point, the actual, actually I do. When my, my friends were, I would make my friends laugh because my friends were all degenerates like me. And I would make them laugh by like drawing. I had this family I, I had made up and it was all family. It was all a family of bad people. It was like, everyone in the family represented some really like negative uh, 
like trope of bad behavior, whether it be this one's a thief, this one's a, a, a drug addict or whatever. <clears throat> I mean, dumb stuff, dude. It was like, you know, anything I could do to get my friends to laugh. It really, that was, that was the number one goal I had as an artist, probably until I was like 17, 16, just make somebody laugh. That's awesome, man. That's it's an interesting, interesting path to get there, man. I, I, I think I, it's cool how like it, you almost didn't even have it planned per se. It's just kind of like, as these different moments are happening in your life, you meet your cousin, he's doing this like skull stuff. And like, you're just kind of bouncing back and forth until you sort of find somewhat of your way. Um, is that sort of where graffiti kind of comes into play? Like, did you find graffiti high school-ish or mm -hmm. how did that kind of come into effect? So that, that first art class I took when I went to high school, um, which is Ben Davis, the teacher's name was Angie Stoner and Stoner looked at my work and said, I need to take Larry Hertz class. And, you know, this is my first art class I'd taken since seventh grade. And she just looked at it and was like, I can tell you need to go get with this guy, which I think is interesting because my art teacher, Larry Hurt, you know, famous, famous to, to a few people. Um, but very beloved, like he had a Disney American teacher award, um, which is obviously a national award. It comes with a one year sabbatical where he tour the world speaking to teachers. You know, he, when I was a student there, he had to leave to go meet the president. Um, so he's just a really amazing guy. And uh, in that class was where I met Ben, who you mentioned before. And at that time, there were graffiti magazines. Like I said, he would bring these magazines to school and it was like shocking, man, because, you know, my teachers would give me an assignment, like do this painting. And I would just never do it. It would take like weeks for me to do anything. I would just smash it the night before, like end up having it barely good enough. Or the teacher saying, looking at me and just knowing that I could do better. So saying, no, take a little extra time. And it was just impossible to motivate me. Um, Graffiti, on the other hand, was like, it was more than art. It was like, it wasn't let's sit alone for hours in, in, the, in solitude. Um, with graffiti, it was like, let's go. Let's, let's gather together and go out into the city. And that, to me, I, I would have hung out with anybody that did that. <laughs> you know, like, I'm glad it was graffiti. But in the end, I met graffiti writers that are artists, and that's really how it became my thing. After that, it was, I just, I, I saw the potential of being able to do something big on a wall. And that, that just, it, it, it was like, I always tell people, it gets you high. Like the first time you go paint, I don't even know, I don't care what it is. I mean, for, uh, for me, dude, if going out to a spot, meeting someone who takes you to a spot, tells you about style, all that stuff the culture unfolds itself to you. You have to gain people's acceptance. Like there's a lot of stuff to it. That is, I'm sure just like sort of masculine, like young kind of like bullshit, you know, can we swear on your podcast? Yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, uh, you know, just like machismo stuff. And I, yeah. and, and in a world where sports was everything, you know, my, my brother and his, and my cousins were all like, pretty hardcore dudes. So I kind of wasn't on their level in terms of being out in the streets. Um, so like I was really always, I felt like I was outside. I didn't have like a boys when I was younger, that was like my guys. Um, until I started to get into, you know, I, I met a bunch of kids when I was younger that like, you know, a bu bunch of single parent home kids who like, just had all way too much time and, uh, and not enough supervision. Um, and graffiti was a perfect transition because it was like, you know, again, I don't even, I don't, I wouldn't tell this story to a high school class because I don't think it would work out for everybody, but it really was, it was like, Oh, we're going to go smoke and we're going to go drink. And like, we're going to stay out at night. We're going to creep around to these spots. We're going to meet weird people. We're going to listen to like hardcore music. It was like, I, it was just great, like hood rat, like dirt bag fun kind of a thing. And in hindsight, it's, you know, compared to anything else we could have been doing, it's pretty innocent. 
but I don't know that I would have gotten excited. Like if I met a bunch of really great illustrators and they were like, Oh, let's just come home and stay at my house and draw. I don't know if I would have gotten into that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and the, the social side of it with graffiti and just the larger than life quality of it, it was, it was exciting, but it took years then to be able to draw, like to be able to paint with cans anywhere close to how I could draw, which is still impossible, but man, that was a rude awakening. So that's another thing is like finding something I was terrible at. That's a whole new it's, medium. Mm -hmm. And I was determined. I was just determined. To, the fact that it was so hard to work with is what made me want to use it. You know, it's it like probably frustrated you to try even harder too. Cause you're like, man, I know what I can do on a piece of paper, but like, if I can get to a place eventually where I could do this on a wall, like you'll be like, that's where I've made it, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's like, if I could just take this drawing I did today and paint that, like that was like the only goal for years. You know what I mean? Because you're drawing, even if your drawing stays the same, it's like, here's the drawing and here's the spray paint, you know? And so like every time, like every two months, six months, you know, one year, year and a half but now you're drawing if you're practicing that is up here you know it's like like there's so uh graffiti gave me a reason to keep drawing and and gave me like some focus for my drawing because you know to me it was never just i mean i love drawing and being alone as a kid and drawing but like as i got into graffiti learning to meet, meeting other people and eventually became a professional it was definitely the like give me a problem uh, to solve like that. That's what excites me. It's not like, Oh, I can draw anything. Well, it's not that exciting to wake up and draw anything, but it's pretty exciting to like, you know, if someone gives me an, a, 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 and that's, that's what graffiti gave me. My friends would sit around and we'd go, we need to do a production based on this. And what that meant is I needed to be able to draw all of that stuff, the characters, the backgrounds, the letters. And then hopefully, cause everybody in the crew was more experienced as a painter. Someone would be able to help, figure out how to paint the rest of it but like it made me an art director that it made me just it went it, it, graffiti changed completely to like something that was actually accidentally very serious in my life you know it's awesome to hear like that man and like another thing too right as you get into it you discover that it's not just paint on a wall it's like there's this steep amount of lore there's a tremendous amount of history there's like all these you know, across the coast, all these different styles yeah. and different approaches to this thing. It's like, it, I just, I equate it to like, it's just, it's already so dense that once you even find out about it, like you just, yeah, you'll just get lost in it, you know? Yeah. And I, I think it, at the time it wasn't so big and it was still huge. Like in terms of, I don't mean the popularity, uh, access, but like, yeah, man. And, and what was possible in terms of style, like it was, you know, like we were, we had this brief exchange about your favorite style era from the Midwest. And, um, I've been thinking on that since then. And for me, like the guy for me is MERS. The guy for me has always been MERS. Even when I later found out that East is basically the godfather of like all of us people in Indiana and Chicago and Ohio, um, and, uh, you know, Kansas city, Missouri, whatever, like, <clears throat> Uh, East definitely was had that original hip hop vibe. Murs was this dude that was like not from the hip hop era. He was my age. I think he was actually maybe a year or two younger, but he was one of these dudes that just was like the first. And you've met guys like this the first time they go paint, it, at least early, it's dope. Like the first time you hear about them, it, it's dope. And you know, so like I was looking at these magazines in '97. And when I've my first year in graffiti and MERS would have these just like the best piece in the whole magazine that I would see. And <clears throat> that became, and so you can see now, man, if you look at one time, MERS was like this seed, this like little epicenter out of which so many styles came. And of course, MERS wouldn't even, would never tell you he invented his style because he could tell you where it came from. You know, like my style, even though I think I have a very original style now, um, I only think that because I know all the things I'm, tr I'm leaving out. I know all the great styles that I like and, and, and that I'm just 
actively avoiding. Like there's so many cool things people do in pieces that to me are just off limits because uh, I don't, I want to know where it came from, you know? So um, that that's a bit of a tangent there for sure. But I don't no, I think it's a, that. I think it's applicable for sure. I mean, and you know, going back to like access, you carrying around that scribble jam mag, you know, th- that is your point of access. You know, you're right. That's literally, if you would have had the internet, I'm sure you would have been looking all over probably until art crime is probably came on the scene. But at that point, you know, now everybody has a billion scribble right. mags in their pocket. So it's like right. the point of reference is just like, you know, and that's where you see things like regional styles kind of fading away over time. And like, you know, right. that, that's definitely a bummer how that's kind of happened. So, you know, that's another reason I also wanted to have you on too, to just kind of, you know, I'm from generations after you as well. So even hearing stories about MERS and, and folks like that's all like, that's all super fruitful knowledge to me that I think, you know, my generation definitely didn't get any of that experience. So it, it's cool to hear that. Um, I, dude, I'm, I'm always appreciative when, when people want to know the stories because the history is really short, you know, honestly, and there's, there's not that many people who know now, is it, is it, am I out here like participating in graffiti? Like I was at one time? No, but everybody who says, Anybody who, who comes in contact with graffiti, you'll meet these people who bring it up in conversation. They haven't painted in years, but it's just a thing that, like I say, you do it, it gets you high and you either become one of these people that keeps trying to get high again off this art um, or you're someone who phases out of it and just remembers it and, and stays inspired by it, you know, and uh, there's a whole generation of people now like that. And we're more than one generation, but um, regional styles too, that you bring up, like I do miss, I miss the regional styles for one main reason. It used to be fun to be able to look at someone's piece and guess within like, guess within like a few states. hundreds of miles. Yeah. Yeah. A few States, uh, where they, where they're from, like that was cool. But I also was excited to, s- I couldn't wait until I got far enough into it to look back and see what my regional style was like. I was excited to be able to know one day, what is the style of Indianapolis graffiti? Uh, Cause I would travel and and bring that up to people and they would be like, Oh, it's you, man. It's IWS. It's, you know, sacred. It's sense. And I'm like, I mean, I get that, but that's still just us. Like what are, you've got the lore and the history before you too, that you're like, that's what I thought it was, you know, from your experience for sure. Well, but it's like me and my friends, of course, we have a unique common thread toward me with our stuff. But I thought eventually you would, I would reach a point where I'd go, well, these new graffiti artists in Indianapolis all have X, Y, Z in common, but the, their influences are so broad. You, it, I can't, I won't say I don't see it. There's a couple of writers I do see like, oh, that you could, that person had grew up looking at pieces in Indianapolis. There's a, there are definitely one or two people I see that I could say that about, but I also think there's so many styles in the world. Like, you know, there's too many great people, too many dope people out there for the guy in your city to be the only artist that inspires you, you know, or, or the crew, the crew in your city or the people like you, they're legendary to you for a lot of reasons, but they're, they may not be the best good graffiti that you see. Like the first dope graffiti I ever saw in person was Tokyo. Like, I mean, I saw other graffiti before that. No disrespect to any of my crewmates or anybody else, but Tokyo, even though that we were beefing at the time, God, man, I would look at his pieces and like, it was just surgery. Like, it was just, it was so, it was better than it needed to be. You know what I mean? And it looked good. Yeah. I, I kind of second that. The first piece I ever saw under a bridge in India was a pacer piece from like 2008. Mm. Mm. And like, I remember me and my buddy, Nate just stood under the bridge looking at it. Like this is, this is untouchable. Like we'll never reach a point where we'll do anything close to this and we're did okay you know, with that, but it just, it lit our brains on fire. Did you know uh, Pacer Pacer's work by that before then? No, no. Uh, that's cool. So yeah, it was literally just, it was so funny, dude. Cause like me and him grew up just outside the city. So we didn't really go to the city all too much. So our connection to graffiti was literally I had seen the style Wars documentary 
and I'd seen trains pass through our town. That's the limit yeah. of any graffiti exposure I had. So I actually remember a conversation when we first started painting where I asked him, Hey, do you think <laughs> it's so funny? It's almost like contact, like the alien movie where like mm-hmm. you finally make contact. Mm-hmm. I remember him and I like hypothesizing, I wonder, you know, if people even write graffiti in Indiana, right. like if this is even a thing that's existed, you know, come to find out later. Yeah. People like you, Dan, people like, you know, Tokyo, the MUL cats, like graffiti has a history here that we totally didn't know, but it's funny yeah. to hypothesize. Are we on an Island out here that, uh, mm. you know, so that's why I see in that MFK piece, it was like, Oh, we are yeah. strongly wrong. There's yeah. been stuff brewing here that is phenomenal that we didn't even know existed. So well, same and with finding your works too. Like you, some of the stuff you and Sacred have done is just like mind blowing, dude. Dude, I uh, I appreciate that, and I'm really glad. I'm really glad to have done ambitious pieces at spots, you know, because some of that stuff still rides, um, which obviously is like an honor too, you know, that people don't go over it. But because there are spots I can think of in town where people do go over stuff, and um, I get it, but it's also it's weird because, you know, we the, the graffiti like culture in Indianapolis is not necessarily new, but it's young enough that we're still seeing pieces that look like maybe the first piece or the first thing painted at this spot is still there. And that's not true about very many places um, where if you've, once you've had 20, 30 years of graffiti, there's not many places left like that unless there's like, unless you're that dude that like people, people just don't want to go over you. It's like they, everybody, it's like, there's a, there's tags and like pieces around town that you know about. That's like, man, I wouldn't want to go over that. I just like seeing that. I'm just glad that that's there. I wouldn't want to be the person to go over it. Even if, even if I think I could crush it now, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's also a bummer too, when, you know, something you have left for a long time, someone does eventually go over and it's like, man, that's been writing for 25 years. And some kid did like a, you know, the most poorly produced piece half over it and didn't even yeah. cover. It's like, dang, but I mean, yeah, paint is temporary and like it, it's not going to last forever, but you know, it's good to have a culture that can try to keep things for as long as we can. Yeah. I mean, it's important to respect things, um, but it's also inevitable that, I mean, like I say, dude, spots are good. People like spots. You know, this is why this is why spots get blown up is because people just like them and they go there and they do their thing. I mean, I remember going to a spot in Cincinnati that I'm sure you've been to. Everybody's been to. Um, and I was just blown away. I was like, this spot is so good. Like, I would want to be here all the time. And then I would talk to these, and then you would see people's like not six, seven, eight, nine pieces down there at that spot. Um, and by the way, the, the piece at this, the entrance to the spot was a big two color MERS on unprimed concrete. That was a masterpiece. And I'm, I haven't been back, but I've heard that, that it's, it's been gone over now. Um, right. But I would talk to people in Cincinnati and realize, oh yeah, they, they don't go anywhere else. Like this spot is so good for them. There's so many walls. It's such a perfect size. Like they don't even bother with these bridges, you know, and for us, there just was no, there wasn't the perfect drainage ditch or the perfect like tunnel to, for at least that I knew about. It was like every, there was just bridge spots. And like, you know, as far as piecing goes where you just like being there, but it's not so good that you only go to that spot. You like, there's something nice about going to all these different places. And when you, when people con when your scene starts to concentrate, like any day, it could be that this bridge in this community is where suddenly all these kids want to go now. And yeah, and, and then, then it's gone. Mm-hmm. So just That's is what wild. it is, man. It's the nature of the beast, you know? Definitely, man. And kind of to uh, do a, a slight transition here to like murals and, and and illustration and fine art like how did mm-hmm. you so you you're in high school you're painting graffiti um did you like you attended an art school right like did you go to heron i think yes sir yep went to heron downtown first for painting and then um in the end there was no illustration program so when i was there um so i just did 
I, I just did general fine art and did like everything, painting and sculpture and took every illustration class twice. That's awesome, man. So like at the time when you were in college, I imagine you're also, you know, knee deep in graffiti at the same time. So how mm-hmm. did you transition to doing murals and, you know, what, mm-hmm. was there a need for doing murals or kind of how did, how did that sort of come about? Um, the mural to for me and really for fab crew, the whole idea with murals was, um, this is how we can do graffiti. Like if we put elaborate d- designs and concepts and, uh, sophisticated color palettes and, and strong technique, basically real art, um, then we could also slap on our graffiti, you know, like our, the inspiration was FX crew, you know? And so at that time, FX crew was, uh, I mean, they were FX crew, which they still are, but they were like, they had this, they had this video out and it was just, it was now there's so many videos, but that was the first one the where for me, where you're just like, you're seeing how they're taking graffiti, regular old traditional graffiti, and they're surrounding it with ridiculous, like high concept characters and like really ambitious and sometimes really like, um, like meaningful narrative designs. Like, you know, they, they would talk about issues like drug abuse and like, you know, socioeconomic status. Like they were, they managed to, and later I would learn, this is what we do. This is how, if you, as a graffiti artist in the nineties and early two thousands, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to get spots public, like nice spots that, that are going to ride where people can see you, you have to work with the community, at, at least where we were. There was, it, you know, it was like, if you do a piece on a wall, and to some people still, but if you do a piece on a wall at that time, like, you're trying to ruin our property value. You, this, this is illegal. You're a liar. You know what I mean? Like, there was no just walk up and do a piece, except at these, like, one or two walls. And so... That's kind of my question too. Like what, what was the state of sort of murals slash graffiti slash art publicly at the time you guys were kind of coming up too? like, what was the public perception compared to, you know, where things continued to? Well, it wasn't, there wasn't really this, um, the number of murals we have now just in Indianapolis, but in the world, it was just nothing. There's no comparison to, you know, at that time, um, I mean, I can't even only now in hindsight, can I think of one muralist or like group that was active at that time? And that's Blyce Edwards. And Blyce Edwards is still out there. They do their thing like they're, you know, I always say like compared to them, most of us are kind of hobbyists in a way because they've got all of this just trade trade experience. Um, but uh, Pamela Bliss, who still do, does her thing now. Pamela was out there doing things. Um, but really, man, it wasn't, I could, I could probably count on one hand the number of murals that I knew about when I was, you know, 20 years old. And that doesn't, that's not to say there weren't other ones, but it was a long time before. I mean, people, people do stuff when there's money, dude, you know? So we're out here trying to do these graffiti murals. Nobody likes graffiti. So we start doing graffiti murals. Um, And that wasn't, there was no demand for it. So you're doing most of that for free. You're just out there doing it. And because murals are difficult and expensive when there was no money in it, people weren't doing them, you know, Um, now that there's money in it, obviously. And it's, it's a whole lot easier to do murals than it used to be like spray paint changed everything. But um, at that time in the, in the nine, late nineties, there were people around, but it wasn't, it wasn't like there was someone we could model ourselves after. There wasn't any, there wasn't a studio we could go hang out at or anything like that, or a gallery that like catered to artwork that that was in our interest, you know? Definitely. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And does, does some of this kind of speak towards like the invisible hometown moniker or like how, how did you sort of come to that, that name and what's the basis of that? That's funny. Um, I mean, yeah, kind of in a way. I mean, the thing was, I was pretty aware 
from from an early point that like whatever we do here kind of is only happening here um that we can all be really moved and and, and excited and and create a movement around something in this city and no matter how powerful it is it's not probably going to get past this city um and why did you feel that way um because because i always felt that like i just looked at what i was doing and what we were doing in graffiti and, and specifically i mean i only had that gauge with i only cared about being good at graffiti or you know what everybody what you would now call street art and that scene wasn't happening here and so like i would look at these other places and i just you could you would see them almost just naturally growing you know and by the time you go to a place you know chicago for example um it's like well i'm i'm better than most of the people i know at this city at this thing or or i see i go wow i could be doing that or like just that feeling of like people in people in other cities know about me but their cities don't know about me, you know, be- and it's really because we just don't have a platform that's that large, meaning a, a, a music festival, for example, whose footprint is large enough that artists associated with it get that, that viral attention. Or we don't have, for example, um, multiple uh, hip hop groups or independent rock groups that when they do their artwork or when they go on tour, that that starts to have a viral impact. There's no, there's no, um, you know, TV stations are not based here. They don't, they don't shoot movies here. So like all that kind of stuff. Um, and really the reality of it being a sports town. I mean, even now the, you, you, you've not seen, like, I don't think our city has not really hammered heavily on public art without there being a major sporting event involved. I mean, um, and it, it, and it's, it's, our, it's the culture of the city, man. It really, it, the sports is the sports push everything, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a wild, it's a wild and pretty accurate perception. And, you know, when you were saying that, what I was kind of thinking in my head was like, when you go to a Chicago, when you go to like a New York city or something, and you're, even when you're like looking in these, these magazines, you're seeing the state that murals and graffiti are in other places and kind of how indie is, maybe compared to those. And and you're also identifying when you do go to a place and, you know, I'm sure some of my experience parallels yours where like, if you travel far enough from Indy, people don't even know. They're like, wait, where's Indianapolis again? You know, like they don't even know that it exists. So you're, you're kind of like, well, with this graffiti and mural stuff, we can probably push it as far as Indy will kind of allow us to push it. But beyond that, the city kind of has to like grow along with us for us to break that ceiling type of a thing. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't even know if I had that, um, if I even thought about it. And that's on, that's like an altruistic. I agree, I think, with what you're saying, but I don't think I was thinking of it that way. I mean, at the time, it was like, will it ever, you know, like, is this just the way it is, um, you know, and is this kind of what we're going to be doing? Uh, and, and to me, there was something, I always kind of got a, got a buzz from the idea that it, this shouldn't, there's no reason we, this should exist. Like there, because there's not an infrastructure, because there's not a market for it, because there's, there seems to be so many like, uh, things working against it. I always felt like it's almost like a more powerful or more interesting to be doing these things when it would just be so much easier not to, or, you know, to move somewhere else. And I used to really wonder like, cause you know, even though I would, I would go to places and think I'm as good as this person or so-and-so I would also realize that other people in these cities have actual competition. Like they really are. There's really, you know, again, to bring use the example of Chicago. I mean, it's like, I don't know how many artists that are competing for the same jobs. It's gotta be hundreds of, for any one job. It's like, there's got to be, you know, at least, you know, on at the highest level of of uh, like street art in Chicago, there's got to be at least 10, 15, 20 people that you could call for a job that maybe they're not equal in style or, or technique, but they're they are equal in profile. They're equal in experience. Um, and, you know, 
I always wondered what that would be like, because here for a long time, it was like, well, if there's any platform at all, we're going to get it, you know? And so it was nice because in a way there was so many things. When you talk about the city growing to support, um, I eventually did realize it was a matter of there being just not a lot of people here. Like everything you do is only as, as hype as the, as the number of people that are actually watching it and, and, and participating. And here, you know, it's like a million people depending on who you ask. And I mean, how many, what percentage of people have to come out to something for you to, for it to feel big, for it to gain traction. Um, you know, so if you look at a city like New York, you got 8 million people plus we're in Chicago. I mean, the metropolitan area of Chicago suburbs and all is like 10 million people. And so if you put something on and, you know, if 1% of 10 million people show up, which is not, it's not 1%, but you know, 1% of 10 million people is a whole lot more than 1% of 1 million people. And so I just look at the simple math number of like, and now in the social media age, it's like, it's, it's that many people, not just coming to the event, not just buying the book or the t-shirt or the artwork, but taking the photo, posting about you, tagging you, you know, wanting you, you know, using you for content on their uh, platform. Like there's the more people you have, it just amplifies your signal, you know, it, and, and it becomes that much more amplified when, when there's a community that, that sort of rallies around it for us, it's always been sports. So there's, there's not going to be a basketball tournament or, or a, a, a Colts, you know, event or a Pacers, you know, playoffs that you're not, it's not going to come and go without you hearing about it. Um, whereas the arts and music that all, I mean, that comes and goes all the time, you know, yeah, it's true anywhere. Just, just less, there's just less people. Yeah, no, that's, that's super interesting to hear. Cause I always wondered like invisible hometown. I figured some of it was along the lines that you spoke to, but it definitely is more concrete now. It makes a lot more sense. And it's also, it's like, literally it's a flyover state, you know, there's just that like idea. It's a flyover state, but tours and bands always just go from Cincinnati to St. Louis. <laughs> mm -hmm. They just kind of pass right over. It also speaks to the fact that if somebody's from Indianapolis, it's, it's, you know, even if they're like really successful, it doesn't become a big part of their story. You know, it's not like, like, um, that always makes me sad, man. Cause like Indy is a pretty rad spot too. Like, you know, some of that, that hidden culture, I think is, is the strength of it in some ways as well. I think it is too. And I mean, you have to ask yourself, is it the only tragedy is that more people didn't know about it or that, I mean, it really is that, that more people didn't know about it. I mean, I think of like the Mud Kids, for example, and Rusty and Rusty's out here. They, you know, they did their thing. They traveled all over. They opened for great people. They performed at great venues. Um, they put out good music. And at the end of the day, they're, it's a, they're local legends now. They're people that here in town matter a lot to people. Um, but, you know, like for me, when once when he shut the books on Fab Crew, you know, that was like, uh, it was realizing that there's a whole section of people in in Indianapolis that are that are not going to hear that signal anymore. They were they were hearing that signal and now they're not going to hear it anymore. And so at that point you can't preserve a legacy. You know, it's like when something comes and goes and it's had its time. I mean, I think about these murals that we've done and uh you know, it's not it's meaningful because it's meaningful to us. And we know that, you know, to me, I look at things in the city. I, I think about, this goes back to graffiti, but it's true of, of a lot of people. To me, I think that I've got a relationship to the city. Like I've seen, I've, I've, I've been to every part of it and uh, to do, and I've washed dishes and I've painted at the, at the Indy 500. And so like, to me, there's a magic in it being a place where it's not obvious, where you don't, I mean, because look at the opposite, you know, a place like Miami, like Miami's so on 10 all the time. It's like there's no subtlety that nothing's a secret. It's like can't breathe. Yeah, it's everything locked. is a thousand miles an hour. It's just fast. 
Yeah, it's very fast. And so I tend to think I've always I do take pride in what you're saying. Like, basically, there, there is stuff. There's great stuff here. But you do have to know about I mean, I believe if you know what's going on. Even in Indianapolis. There's something for you to do every weekend. There's mm-hmm. there are interesting people for you to know. It might be the same. Like you might have to go to the same gallery like two months in a row. You know what I mean? Or you might you might end up you might see all your shows at two or three different venues. Um, but there's culture to be plugged in. The problem is people don't people don't know what they like. They like what they know. And a lot of you know that's that's something that that I learned in advertising, and uh, like I, every, I almost I almost didn't say it because I was like, it's one of these things that once you real once I realized it, it took me years to recover from. Like, you can't make people love you, man. You know, and so when you have so you see like why is it Kenny Chesney can sell fifty thousand tickets at Lucas Oil Stadium, um, but like I I just played at Healer two weeks ago and, and the whole band I think got 80 bucks. Um, it's like, it only costs $10 to come see us, you know? Uh, but Kenny Chesney is Kenny Chesney. I'm not even, I mean, whatever you two or Name anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Billy Eilish. It's like, you know, I'm not saying there's an artist here as good as Billy Eilish. My point is um, you can go see Billy Eilish once a year or every two years but then you can find artists here that you can go see. And then you get to, you get to have the joy of being able to support that artist. Cause dude, you'll meet, you'll meet people that are fans and you realize you'll go to enough, whether it be shows, art events, restaurants, you go to enough of these things and you realize there's like 20 or 30 people that show up to everything. Like these 20 or 30 people, they're the glue that is holding this community together. That makes it a scene when people come back and return Um, and so, you know, that's, that to me is powerful. Um, and I don't, when I, the invisible hometown is also my hope that it doesn't really matter. Right. It's like being from, like, I would also hate to be that an artist that's like, all I am is from where I'm from. It's like, you know, I have all these like, oh, you're a, whatever, you're a Miami artist. And now my head's full of just Miami shit. And now I don't care about your art. And so I feel well, like there's there, a cachet that comes with where you're from. It's like, Oh, they're from LA. It's mm-hmm. ooh, or, you know, it's just or whatever like, the baggage is. Yeah. You're like, I don't care where I'm from. The art is the message. I mean, kind of that's, that's what I hope, you know? And it's funny because people always talk about, you got to put your city on your back. You have to represent for your city. Um, and I don't disagree. I do agree, but I also think um, you have to give your city ways to support you you have to give everybody ways to support you or, or you'll always be going, where's all the people, where's all my engagement, you know? Yeah, no, I, I definitely feel that. And kind of speaking to that, I, I was, I kind of have been starting to ask different guests this, but what were, what were some of the lowlights with some of like your artistic development or what was like a key moment that you were like, man, this, this sucks. Like, I don't, I don't know why I'm doing this. Like I, Cause I feel like every artist has some moments like that, but you know, mm-hmm. through the development, I'm sure, you know, I like I'm relatively early on in my artistic development, but I'm sure 20 years from now I'll, you know, hit the fan with something that I'm, you know, mm-hmm. not prepared for whatsoever. And, mm-hmm. you know, just some of the existential dread that comes with being an artist, you know, some yeah. of it's heavy. So what, what's your experience with some of that? Um, that's a, that's actually a really good question because, it's hard to pinpoint. I mean, everything in hindsight feels like it needed to happen. You know what I mean? But um, for me, I mean, one of the, the lowest point for me was definitely that first like year or so after, after I left the advertising world and I no longer had a day job because I was taking everything. It was like, I mean, I was doing whatever I could possibly do and, and losing my mind doing it. Like it wasn't, it was very, it was very bad for me, like to go from having this collaborative environment for years, uh, which I had in advertising, which even when it was slow and they didn't, and there was nothing for me to, 
even there's really no reason for me to be there anymore. There at least was not, at least was not there alone. And so to go from that to like salary, people around, nice office to sitting at home, like just doing whatever job I could possibly do um, all by myself. Like it was, that was hard, dude. That was extremely, it was extremely bad for me. And I don't think I ever really like, I never really mastered it. I never, I never got to the point where that was, that was really working well for me. Um, I, it, you know, eventually the best thing for me was to get into a studio environment where there at least was, was a person around sometimes I'm at least getting up, leaving the house and like starting my day because even when you don't have anything that it happened again in 2020, man, when everything like, I mean, 2020 was ugly. I mean, that's not news to anybody, but it was why, I mean, it was like, I, I moved into the studio in March, the beginning of March, the next week, it was all over. Like the, all of our clients, fab crew at that time was all marketing, all events based, you know? So it was like live painting or uh, interior decorating, commercial real estate decorating. And like it, all the companies stopped doing that. No live events, no, no renovations. So it was like really over in an instant. Um, and then, you know, I was glad to have a place to at least get up and go, get up and leave the house and go, I am working today. I am an artist at my art job, you know? So that figuring out that dynamic was, was pretty, pretty tough. Um, I will say too, once I got, once I eventually got a lot more steady work as a muralist, the low point after that for me was doing laser tag murals. Um, that was definitely the job where I was like, dude, I know people that are really good at this and I've seen them, them do, do amazing work. I don't have any problem telling you I was not good at this job. It was because I couldn't use spray paint. Um, yeah, it was just hard, dude. It was, it was for, it was only one person, you know, they would, you would send you out by yourself to paint 4,000 square feet of mural in four days. And, um, they had very specific requirements as to what they, uh, as to what they needed to be like. And, um, uh, I'm going to have to plug you in here. Um, oh, you're good. And, you know, there, there were these, and I, the other artists there had, had gotten really good at doing this. And I honestly have no idea how they, they, uh, they managed it. Cause it was the hardest job. It was the hardest job I've ever had period. So, uh, that, cause I would be doing, you know, the thing was, man, that after four days, the, you know, they only wanted you there four days. So if you were there longer than four days, it was a different arrangement. And so I'd be there the first night, 12 hours, the next night, 16 hours. And then the last, like the last day I would be there for like 27, 28 hours straight and still leave like defeated because it, didn't, it just it didn't look great, you know? And it was a very challenging environment because they would, I went in to do some rent of like some repaints. And so these are fully functional laser tag joints that they close it for four days because you're supposed to be there for four days and on the fifth day bro they got birthday parties all day and so whatever you get done in those four days that's what you get done because otherwise they're flying you back out at a lower rate and, and you're going to be covering part of those expenses yourself so like it was a very 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 challenging uh environment and i know artists that do it that do amazing work um and i I, I don't even know how they do it. I really don't. But that was, uh, yeah, that was a moment where I was like, there's got to be a better way because I wasn't designing any of the work. You know, they have their, their whole in-house team that designs everything. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm just there as like a laborer to do the, to do the murals and human printer, human printer. Yeah, man. And that's just not, it made me realize that's not what I do. It's, it's, it's not what I do and it's not what I do well, you know? So, um, 
And it, it was a, it, I just looked at, I've always thought of painting as a blue, blue collar job. I've always thought of murals as being like a blue collar job. It's physical, you know, it's, there's a lot of things to consider. It's not necessarily just about you. You're, you're through providing a service. Um, and I did that and I was like, no, this is a blue collar job. This is a, this is a kill yourself to barely, to barely get dragged across the finish line. You know, I spent like one day I worked so late, I missed my flight home and spent Thanksgiving in an airport, you know, like, and I'm, I'm not even saying that's their fault. Uh, you know, I, I'm just saying like, I realized I, I, at that time, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I was taking every job just so I could make a living. And that was when I, I just drew a line in the sand and was like, there's some things I, that I'm just not supposed to do, you know, and specifically it had to be, I need to get back more into the design side, you know? So, definitely. Uh, and I feel like I've in the last, you know, five years, I've been increasingly like leveling up on the design. Um, and as much as it was tough to separate from fab crew, um, that was also very freeing because working the, the downside of working as the art director in a team is that you have to play to everyone's strengths. And so I worked with someone who's their, their strength was specifically working from photo reference. And, um, I, you know, I could design something, an illustrative concept that they could interpret, but it would be like as, as close to a one-to-one -one reprint of my sketch, meaning I had to design it completely or, um, kind of let them fill in the blanks and, and then it becomes a little bit more of an abstract or like a, a stylized portion. And so without having that sort of, uh, stipulation, I'm now drawing, I'm now designing things that are just completely, I mean, the last few things I've worked on were completely from imagination. There's no, there's no like imagery in it. There's no human characters. It's just almost fantasy art. Um, and so I'll be, I'll be painting those designs next week, but um, yeah, the low point for me was, was definitely realizing how hard I was working for how little reward. I mean, you can work, you can paint all day and get nothing out of it, you know? Yeah. At a certain point, it's like, you're just painting, you're like a commercial printer, you know, you might as well be painting just a wall, one color. You well, know, blue. but you're not, you're spending eternity doing something that you probably, when it's all said and done, you're like, I wasn't even that excited to do this in the first place. You know, I wasn't excited and, and I wasn't good at it, bro. And I just think as an artist, there's only, you're, you're, you got two, you only, there's only two like requirements to having this career. Are you, are you good at it? Can you actually perform this, this service? Um, whether that be your design uh, you know, ability or your drawing chops. And do you enjoy, do you care? Because if you don't care about it, you shouldn't be there because we all know, we all know there's a hundred people standing behind us who would do it for free because I used to be that guy. I did it forever for free. Like I only started trying to get compensated properly because um, I saw how competitive the field was getting. And it, it just, it just kind of forced me to like, Force me to value my time more seriously, you know? Definitely. No, that's a, it's a great perspective on it, man. And I feel like I, I couldn't do a, uh, a Dan Thompson podcast without bringing up subsurface, man. Yeah. You know, that was, a uh, it was pretty crazy seeing even cruddy JPEGs on the internet of previous, <laughs> uh, subsurfaces <laughs> I wasn't around for. Yeah. You know, there's, there's some crazy stuff and some really integral folks that you brought to this city. And, you know, I have immense respect for that. And, you know, it's definitely provided tons of, tons of like, like you said before, you had the, the scribble mag that you would mm -hmm. kind of glance through. I had these previous years of subsurfaces that I know are yeah. tucked underneath tons and tons of layers of paint on some of those walls. So, it, you know, mad props for doing that. And if, if, if you can tell some of our listeners too, who, may not know of subsurface or some of the mm -hmm. history of it. Not, you know, I'd love to hear you expand on that a little, if you can. Sure, man. Um, so subsurface, um, the whole idea really with subsurface was to create a, an event, a jam, as we called them, um, that 
focused on graffiti and basically created uh, what I call an open air gallery of graffiti. And the thing that was important um, in the first, the first year that we did, it was 2002 in Broad Ripple. And that was only people from Indiana and then some like adjacent people. Cause they have crewmates in Chicago or um, yeah, I think that's probably, probably it Chicago. Um, that year we met a lot of people um, for the first time, the Kisa crew from uh, East Chicago, Indiana, Indiana's first graffiti crew. Um, they, and other people came down based th- th- that year. I was only, I was only like hospitality. That was, that turned out to be my strength. And that's the whole reason I kept doing it because I enjoyed this idea that people come to town and they go, Oh, where do I paint? And I go, check it out. Like I thought about you, who you are, what you do and this wall, what it takes to do this wall. And I've decided that you are the person for this wall. And, and, I can count on one hand the number of times I showed somebody a wall and they were like not feeling it. And they were usually the people who were, were going to have a problem with it. You know, it's like some people are like that. And graffiti is a wild thing where somebody might be a legend in their city and they show up to your city and you accidentally put them on a wall that is on, like to them an actual insult. Um, but I'm from Indianapolis. Like my thing is like, the worst spot you give me, the more impressed you'll be when I, when I, when I go ham on it, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but other people didn't see it that way. So there was a lot to, that was a, a big uh, eye opening experience as I met other artists from other places. But the point of subsurface was to bring world-class graffiti artists that we look up to and respected to come and paint in Indianapolis. I mean, even look, looking back on it, I don't even know why we wanted, why we thought it was possible except we went to St. Louis and we're like, well, if they all come down here, like St. Louis is not, it's not any kind of crazy city. Um, But St. Louis had, you know, a lot of derelict property or just an overall vibe of like, you know, the more people care about their property, the more, the more investment that's been poured into a city, the harder it is to paint. Um, And, so St. Louis was like this place where we had a false image of how you could do this massive mural project. Yeah, the city just gives you a seven mile flood wall. <laughs> yeah. It's like there ain't there ain't a flood wall in Indy like that per se. No, and if there was, dude, it, we're not <clears throat> we're not getting it for that purpose. And you know, it's like because you because if it happened here, you'd have to talk to everybody from IU to Eskenazi, Eli Lilly, like the, the the motor speedway like everybody would have a seat at the table if you tried to do that um definitely but anyway a lot of red tape we, but we decided to do it and um the first year so uh, somebody a lot of people don't think about in terms of subsurface is dose dose one who's a founder of iws co-founder of iws crew and uh he was the first one when i started <clears throat> um I'm going to have to put a hood on. It's getting a little chilly in here. Um, when I first started, he was the one in the crew that was the most uh, committed to doing like, he, he was like, I, he wanted to do gallery shows. He wanted to do commissions. He wanted to, you know, he wanted to get paid to speak um, at museums. And like, he just saw this whole world beyond it. Like, I didn't really understand. I mean, people were doing that in style wars, you know, but to me, I I look, I had this very silly notion that you had your art needed to be unquestionable before you decided to push it forward as a business or before you try to put a a brand on yourself um, and try to become known and be the expert. And that's actually not true. Um, But I thought it was. And subsurface was like this way to put the art at the center because I I'm curating the, the people that I think, you know, you're at least, you're at least like competent, know how to do this piece. And some people are artists that I actually look up to. Uh, and I could put, I could still make it about the art and keep the style at the forefront. And I felt like that, if you show people the best graffiti, then you are showing them good art, you know? Um, but if you just have a graffiti event, that's like 
willy nilly. It's just you and your friends. You're, you're, you're showing them. You're showing them in many ways, the opposite of art. You're showing them, a, you're showing them a, like cultural rituals. You, you know, I'm not saying that that's not art, but um, so for us, that was always the goal. And the second year was, the, was when we invited um, the DF guys. So scribe uh, from Kansas city and then uh, so the other TSC guys from Cincinnati, Devious, that was his first time coming through. Um, Dens from Chicago, that was the first time meeting him. Mines from, uh, at that time from Louisville, originally from Minneapolis. Um, and so Subsurface was, that was the second year. And it was immediately like, this makes us part of the scene. Like having this event make puts us in touch with people and makes Indianapolis a visible hometown, you know? Um, and, but again, to the only to the graffiti community, which was the only people we wanted to reach anyway, um, because we felt like as soon as we started inviting uh, outsiders to the table, you know, man, we didn't want to listen to anybody. We just didn't want to listen to what anybody had to say. So that means I'll do it for free. I don't care. I'll, I'll give you my paint. Like I'll give you a place to stay, you know, um, I'll find a way to get to like help you get like a plane ticket or whatever. Um, and with very rare exception, we, we never really had much support from the outside. Um, in 2005 to 2011, we went from Broad Ripple, which was, you know, when I was in high school, Broad Ripple was the hip part of town. Um, at, it, it faded um, and is still, still a bit faded um but we decided that it would be easier for us because broader was it was hard to get them to sign off on letting us do our thing because we knew people were going to be out there again smoking and drinking loud music um and it, ultimately it was going to look like graffiti which people think is a crime i mean it's kind of hard to explain to somebody no this is not a crime we're out here we have permission but to them, it could only be a crime. Like doing it is a crime. What even if they somebody let you do it? You know what I mean? So, um, so Broad Ripple was very precious about their stuff, as they still are, and they have a lot of absentee landlords, which means they're not that interested in working with you anyway. So, we moved down to the South Side, um, the American Tent and Awning Company, for those five six years, um, and that's when it expanded because we just had all these walls and. Another spot, the Midwest Concrete Wall, um, you know, there were people that would come to town and we wanted to put them on the, the tent wall because we felt like it was a wall of fame, but they liked this other wall because it was smooth and it was short. And so they would go over to like what we thought was like the wax spot. Um, but it was so underground, like people would get wind of it. And, you know, we would, I did a couple interviews and um, from, from time to time, but the whole point of it was to bring the graffiti community to us. Um, and once it, once it ended in 2015, um, I was like, well, I can keep doing this. I can keep spending more of my time and money trying to convince people to come to Indianapolis. Cause you have to understand in the early to mid two thousands, there were no events to compete with. It wasn't, it wasn't it just didn't exist like we had been to them so we knew it was possible but it wasn't this thing where every city has one like and now every single city has not a graffiti event but something with spray paint cans you know um and so it was a lot easier to get people to come from even new york or la uh to come and paint because there wasn't somebody waving a plane ticket in their face to come to Miami. It's like, you know, that was a, that was a tough pill to swallow. Cause I would, I, one year I had the creatures crew booked and it was like, Oh, cool. Cause creatures do, they do these big walls. Like they're going to go ham and you know, like a month or maybe two weeks before they're like, Oh, sorry, man, we're going to go to Colorado crush. And it was like, bro, of course you're going to Colorado crush. No surprise. I just, I just felt like a fool for thinking you were going to come here. Um, <laughs> So I, I just realized I realized I could stop trying to compete with all these other events um, and engage with the community by doing a little bit of traveling on my own. 
So, um, and having done it again since, I mean, we, as you know, we revived it last year and uh, we had the rain out. It was a little rough, um, but it's a different thing now, even trying to invite people to come and paint as an event. It's just a different thing. I mean, uh, everybody's busy, man. All the people I came up with and all the people I looked up to, they're professionals now. Uh, you know, some people I know will come and paint with me for free and just to hang for fun. But for the most part, if you want to take, if you really want public attention, it's like this gray area of really well executed graffiti pieces isn't really where people want to be. They want big, elaborate, you know, beautiful girls and birds, murals, you know, or even, you know, or, or even like, well, you know, tasteful abstractions even. But what nobody, what nobody wants to like give you any money for is people to just come to town and paint graffiti. It would be like, it would be like paying 30 skaters to come and just do tricks like in your, in your parking lot. Like nobody, like you have to really like that in order to want that. You know what I mean? So um, I like, think it's, it's pretty niche. It's niche. And even though people like graffiti now um, versus before, I'm not saying it can't be done and I'm not and I'm certainly not done. I'm not done with it, but it's a very different climate now when you think about doing these events, even people that I know that are friends of mine, it's like, if I'm going to bring them here, how do we make it worth their while? How do we make it more than a weekend where they come and drop a piece? Um, you know, how do we, and now everything is so charged in terms of like it's socio political implications of the work you're doing and who's doing it. Um, it's, it, it's a, it's a very different, undertaking to put together a street art festival um than it was you know all the way from 2002 to 2015 you know so um i'm proud to have done it and it definitely was a thing where it it changed it subsurface i don't mind saying changed the face of indianapolis it definitely you know fountain square with all the walls that are there now that alleyway that people raised a bunch of money for last year um, Fountain Square as the street art capital that we know it of today, like would would not exist without Subsurface. All the walls in Broad Ripple, that alleyway, and some of the ones that came because of the relationships, but Chromatic Store that's there now, none of that stuff would have been there. None of that stuff was like that until until Subsurface. So I'm I'm definitely proud of that. I also don't think I don't expect to keep getting credit for that in the future. You know what I mean? But, um, but I mean, we, we wanted to change the city and, and I think we did, you know, that's huge, man. That's like the, the fact that you had that as a goal to set out and do, and you can, you know, you've progressed long enough to be able to see the effect of some of that. It's like really cool. I'm sure it's been awesome to see as a, as a viewer from your, per, your perspective, like the city kind of grow and change for good and for bad in some ways, but regardless you've been able to watch kind of the development of it in some some form yeah and to see it to see it become um something else you know like because there's there are artists now uh that are that are painting like you know there are people now who are like oh this artist is like uh the most the most prolific muralist in indie or it's the most the best street artist where they call people graffiti artists who've never done graffiti um so there are artists now whose fan base like dramatically outweighs mine. Um, and they're not, and I don't know if I could say they're doing what they do because of subsurface or because of fab crew. Um, but I can say for sure that uh, when there wasn't anybody else doing it, at least for a while, we were still doing it. And uh, do the thing is you want to, to your point, you want to see the city grow and change. You want to, you want to see the city become more. And honestly, that's all, that's what cities do. And for the most part, like, unless obviously an industry folds on you, but you know, cities grow and they continue to change. So what excites me is the idea I had, I had the, the honor and, and excitement of doing walls, uh, whether they be graffiti or murals as like a cultural 
uh, ritual, something that mattered to me on a personal level. But that's really just for me. Now there's another, there's a different thing. Now it's, now it's where, what is my place? How do, how do I see these new artists and how does it inform what I do and recontextualize my work? Cause it really does. It's really cool to be able to see people surround you. And then, it, and it helps you, for me, it helps me to have a better understanding of what I'm doing. If that makes any sense. Oh, for sure. Definitely. I can, I can only imagine how seeing like different people come up, after you and just like the certain paths and stuff that they take, how that informs you, you can reflect on your own decisions that you made in your development and say, Oh, I, you know, I was influenced by this at this time and kind of went this direction and, and mm-hmm. vice versa, just how the scene sort of bounces around and grows in certain directions and comes back other ways is probably cool, cool. And maybe sometimes painful to observe over, over the years. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, dude, but, it's just good to see growth in general. Like, and I'm, I'm happy to understand that, uh, you know, some of the people I look at that I know what they did changed the city, inspired me, created opportunity for me. They're not around anymore, you know, and people don't, people don't know in general who they are unless they know. Um, but that's okay, man. What matters to me is that people make things like I'm not here to really judge. I'm trying definitely not to judge what people do and trying more um, to be motivated by it and just go like, you know, I don't knock anybody's hustle, man. You know, it, there's, there's easier ways to make a living. I think. Well said, man. Well, Dan, this was, this was fun, dude. I, uh, definitely learned a lot and I don't know we've, we've painted many at different times, but I feel like every time we paint, there's, um, nuggets of wisdom for sure. in there, man, you've, you've, you've gritted it out through paths in indie, previous to myself and other artists of the current era through stuff that, you know, we didn't really have to face. So Mm. it's, it's it's admirable. You've, you've kind of been able to accomplish all that you guys have done. Man. I appreciate you saying that dude. Um, That's a huge compliment. And uh, I'm grateful for the experience that I've had. I'm glad to be from a a small city. Um, And I think it's, I'm glad that people are inspired. Obviously I've had fun getting to meet, new people, younger people and paint with them and just kind of understand what their, their journey is and where it's going. Um, if I can be inspiring to people and if I can, I mean, this is cliche. People say, if I can inspire one person, I don't want to inspire just one person, but, uh, that's the coolest thing you can do as an artist, man, to inspire other people and and help make a way for them. So I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely, man. Heck yeah. I think we just cooked through like an hour and a half or something like that. So we did, buddy. We did. Yeah. Thank you. This was fun, dude. Enjoy some weather out there. Maybe bike around. Oh yeah, dude. I've been biking back and forth to my, my studio is now a mile and a half from the house. So I want to bike every day, which is good. Perfect. man. But you too, man, have a good day and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks man. Appreciate it. All right, brother. Thanks. See ya.